before Evil Knievel or Harry Houdini, before P.T. Barnum's circus, Sam Patch drew crowds of thousands who came to watch his dangerous leaps from rooftops, waterfalls, cliff sides, the top of a ship mast, into the waters below. Patch was a drunk, a scoundrel, a roughneck mill worker, a hero of the working class, and the first true American daredevil. Over time and after his death, Patch grew from a man to a myth. Stories about him twisted and changed. Patch was forced into political ideologies and made into cautionary warnings. His enigmatic catchphrase, some things can be done as well as others, was a rallying cry, a proud proclamation of American grit. At the same time, he came to embody the very American folly of having a thirst for celebrity at any cost. His jumps increased in difficulty and spectacle, and his popularity grew. And just as Paul Bunyan had a blue ox, Sam Patch had a pet bear who accompanied him to various taverns and at least once made a jump along with Patch. Like all great folk heroes, Sam Patch is memorialized in songs, poems, and in children's books. President Andrew Jackson named his horse after him. Even today, Patch's story is still being retold and reimagined. Why? What is it about Sam Patch, about daredevils in general, that is so intertwined with Americana? What is it about this story that necessitates its continual retelling? We'll get into all of that in this episode. Welcome to the Niagara Falls Daredevil Museum. In this podcast, we'll examine the bravery, stupidity, hubris, and eccentricity of people who have attempted daring feats at Niagara Falls. My name is Theodore Carter. I'm an author whose novel research went too far, and I got swept up in the current of stranger-than-fiction stories surrounding Niagara Falls. Now, I'm putting that research into this podcast. Born in 1799, Sam Patch spent his youth laboring in a mill in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, along with many other children. Patch grew up before child labor laws, and he worked long hours and was likely kept awake and alert by the occasional paternal smack from an overseeing spinner. A spinner was the chief operator of enormous textile machines called spinning mules that wove cotton into yarn. Running a spinning mule required several people, usually the spinner himself and several boys. These machines and the mills that housed them helped usher in the American Industrial Revolution. After years of laboring as a child, Sam became a spinner himself, a respectable and decent paying job for a man of humble beginnings like Sam. But Sam wanted something more, something grand. The Pawtucket Falls next to the mill was also a gathering point for the town's young boys. It was a swimming hole, a fishing spot, and the bridge running over the falls became a diving platform, a main stage for youthful bravado as swimmers dropped 50 feet into the river. As the town grew up around the falls, new buildings provided new launching points for the jumpers, creating new and more spectacular launch pads. Soon, the jumpers were taking off from 100 feet above the water, Sam Patch was one of these skilled jumpers. Crowds gathered to watch Patch and his friends. The responsible citizenry voiced opposition to this unseemly spectacle, and there was talk of forbidding such behavior, but the respectable people of Pawtucket couldn't stop young men from leaping from high places into the river. Sam Patch moved from Pawtucket to Patterson, New Jersey, and worked as a spinner next to the Passaic Falls, a beautiful, rocky, 77-foot-tall waterfall, the second largest waterfall east of the Mississippi. Accounts from the time report that Sam, beaten down by busted business deals and hard work, had grown bitter and was frequently drunk. When a local businessman, Tim Crane, touted the unveiling of a new bridge across the Passaic River that would lead to a hoity-toity park and restaurant, Patch vowed to steal his day. 
as the citizenry assembled to watch workers slide the new bridge into place with an elaborate system of ropes and floats, Sam Patch emerged perched high above the river. With a mighty leap, he stole Crane's audience and positioned himself as a hero standing against all the aristocratic heirs of people like Crane who were privatizing and monetizing the natural wilderness near the falls. The poet William Carlos Williams retold this story of Patch's jump at Passaic Falls in his five-book epic poem, Patterson, published between 1946 and 1958. His version, which includes an account from an old man who was a supposed eyewitness to Patch's jump, is included here. When the word was given to haul the bridge across the chasm, the crowd rent the air with cheers but they had only pulled it halfway over when one of the rolling pins slid from the ropes into the water below. While all were expecting to see the big clumsy bridge topple over and land in the chasm, as quick as a flash, a form leaped out from the highest point and struck with a splash in the dark water below, swam to the wooden pin and brought it ashore. This was the starting point of Sam Patch's career as a famous jumper. I saw that, said the old man with satisfaction, and I don't believe there is another person in the town today who is an eyewitness of that scene. These were the words that Sam Patch said. Now old Tim Crane thinks he has done something great, but I can beat him. As he spoke, he jumped. There is no mistake in Sam Patch. There is no mistake in Sam Patch was one of Patch's often used slogans. Other reports have Sam Patch coming up with another one of his catchphrases on this day, some things can be done as well as others. Patch became a hero of the everyman, and his feud with Crane continued. On July 4th, Crane sold tickets to a fireworks show on his private property. Patch scheduled another jump and drew a crowd of three to 5,000 people, according to newspaper estimates. The population of the entire town was around 6,000. Afterward, he passed a hat around and collected $13, which is the equivalent of around $400 today. Crane may have netted more money with his event, but no doubt Sam won the hearts of the townspeople, especially the working class, who likely could not have afforded Crane's fireworks show. Sam's growing fame propelled him away from Patterson, New Jersey to Hoboken, New York, where, in 1828, likely drawn in by a local businessman, Patch made a hundred-foot jump off the masthead of a ship into the Hudson River. Not everyone enjoyed Patch's brand of entertainment. The New York Inquirer wrote, We remember a sleight-of-hand man who was exhibiting his feats in a village in this state, much to the astonishment of the audience. At length, he said, Ladies and gentlemen, I have one feat that will astonish you. So saying, he spread a carpet on the floor and with a pistol, very coolly blew his brains out. The villagers were very much tickled, but exceedingly grieved when they discovered that there was no sleight of hand in it. Sam Patch was lowbrow. He was lowbrow in the way P.T. Barnum was lowbrow, the way popular theater at the time was lowbrow, and while many condemned his feats as tawdry and grotesque, this certainly didn't harm his popularity. He became known as the Jersey Jumper, the Yankee Leaper, and his growing popularity brought opportunity. A group of businessmen invited Patch to Niagara Falls. They planned a series of events that would include a dynamite blast of a nearby rock face, a ghost ship sent over the falls for sheer spectacle, and a leap off the falls from Patch. Patch agreed to the jump, and on October 6, 1829, thousands came by steamboat and by foot for the event. Vendors sold food and liquor, and circus performers and traveling acting troops worked the crowd. However, when time came for the series of spectacular events, the explosion paled in comparison to the steady tumult of the thundering falls, leaving spectators underwhelmed. The ghost ship broke apart in the rough current of the Niagara River, capsized, and sank before going over the falls. Worst of all, Sam Patch didn't show. It's hard to imagine the crowd's disappointment 
or the ire of the group of businessmen who had failed so spectacularly and so publicly, but clearly this did not go well. Some of the failure was the result of poor planning. Some was bad luck. However, Patch not showing up was a rather egregious offense, one might think unforgivable. Nonetheless, he did appear the next day, as did the crowd. Promoters of the event exploded several other rock faces along the river in coordination to make up for the previous day's lackluster blast. And by all accounts, the explosions were somewhat improved, though still underwhelming. Sam climbed to his specially built platform above the falls and this time made his historic leap. This moment, I imagine, is where the magic lies for Sam Patch. There's something truly horrible about the idea of watching a man fall from heights that you know are likely to kill most people. I came to watch this? What kind of person am I that I would come to watch a man do this? What if he dies? We can think of a number of acts billed as death-defying, and all of them make use of these complex feelings of hope, awe, fear, and shame. If I had been in the crowd as Sam Patch plunged into the Niagara River, I'd have been holding my breath for his safe return to shore, not only for his sake, but also to validate my own decency and prove that I did not come out of an immoral appetite for the grotesque. Then, imagine being in a crowd of thousands assembled around the violent roar of the falls and imagine the relief you would feel the collective exaltation you would have shared with those around you when, a short time later, Sam Patch emerged from the white water below and swam safely to shore, unaided, then stood on a rock, singing out in celebration. A few days later, Patch issued an announcement apologizing for missing his scheduled jump on October 6th but stated that he felt it necessary to jump the following day to prove that I was the true Sam Patch and to show that some things could be done as well as others. He promised another jump at the falls from a point 50 feet higher. During his time in between jumps, Sam enjoyed his celebrity and the cavalcade of media attention. He was seen in Buffalo at parties and taverns, often drunk, entertaining his many curious admirers. He took to wearing a red silk sash and a sailor coat and made extra money as an exhibit at Jonathan McCleary's museum where patrons would pay for the opportunity to meet the famous daredevil. It was at this time too when Sam Patch acquired a pet bear, perhaps from McCleary which, while doubtlessly impractical, certainly furthered his mythological status. In subsequent poems and ballads, Patch's bear became a prominent character and even narrated William Getz's 1986 novel, Sam Patch, The Ballad of a Jumping Man. Excitement continued to build and build. So, on October 17th, Sam Patch stood at the base of his elevated platform. He removed his shoes and sailor jacket and tied his silk sash tight to his waist. He ignored the dramatic pleas of onlookers warning him not to undertake the stunt, Thousands watched him climb a ladder extended out over the cliffside to a platform high above the pool. An American flag pinned atop the platform waved in the wind, and as Sam stood there on the border of America and Canada, his platform swaying precariously back and forth, he took a small corner of the flag and kissed it. Then, again, he jumped, straight and true, hands at his side, Again, the crowd held its collective breath, and again, he emerged from the depths below, whole and unharmed. And again, newspapers and the public debated whether he was great or grotesque, a brave everyman or a foolhardy drunk. Shortly after his triumph at Niagara, Patch announced that he would make a 100-foot jump at Genesee Falls on November 6th which, advertisements point out, is tactfully after Election Day. Let every man do his duty at the polls, and Sam, afterwards, will do his at the falls, reads the ad. It went on to state that those interested in the miraculous jump could buy subscription papers at several Rochester taverns. 
Sam and his bear secured lodging in the Rochester Recess, a pet-friendly establishment offering rooms, pickled oysters, candy, hot meals, and a fully stocked bar. Patch's bill was paid, according to historian Richard M. Dorson, by a group of local sportsmen accustomed to patronizing boxers, gymnasts, and wrestlers. The recess also sold instruments and was the center for a local musical tradition which included the Rochester Band. The band, while they did perform music, was more like a fraternal drinking club open to any white man willing to pick up an instrument and included many of Rochester's leading businessmen. One can imagine Patch holding court in the saloon of the Rochester Recess, drinking beer and eating pickled oysters amidst lots of drunken laughter and a cacophony of brass and drums. When not drinking, socializing, and taking care of his pet bear, Sam made scouting missions to the falls to examine its properties and to make whatever observations Sam Patch made before leaping from great heights. The population of Rochester at the time was around 8,000, while estimates of the crowd assembled to watch Sam Patch's jump range from 6 to 10,000. Based on reports of the circus-like atmosphere of the crowd that assembled for Patch in Niagara, it's likely that the Rochester crowd was similarly ruckus and eclectic. The city elite mixing with the rough and tumble mill workers who knew of Patch from Tavern Talk. Sam arrived leading his pet bear by a chain. Finding his spot on the limestone overlook, he bowed to the crowd and took a sash from his head and tied it to his waist, a splash of color reminiscent of his showmanship in Niagara. What was new and different was that before he made his leap, Patch pushed his bear off the ledge. The bear splashed into the river below and swam safely to shore. Next, Sam did the same, spurned the boat poised to help him, and made his way out of the river to proclaim, some things can be done as well as others. There is no account of whether or not Patch attempted to collect his pet bear, and I could not find any evidence of the bear making a second leap. I really got sidetracked with some bear research here, but to no avail. I'm forced into conjecture. It's possible that it's not easy to gain the trust of a bear after thrusting it off a 100-foot ledge, and that close proximity to a bear that does not trust you is more dangerous than leaping over waterfalls. <coughs> so, now likely without a pet to care for, Patch could focus on capitalizing on the fervor he'd created and soon advertise another leap that would make use of a 25-foot platform to place him even higher above the river. In addition, he'd jump on Friday the 13th, defying superstition. Posted advertisements appear not only in Rochester, but in neighboring towns as well. Schooners and coaches brought the curious from nearby counties, and the Rochester hotels filled up. The morning of the 13th, grocery stores and whiskey purveyors did brisk business. Estimates put the crowd size at 12,000 people, and as the time for the scheduled jump approached, they lined the streets and sat on rooftops waiting for Sam Patch. Someone passed a hat around to collect money for the performer. Patch spent the morning drinking at the Rochester recess and receiving gifts from his new friends, including a black silk sash, which he tied around his waist, and white band uniform pants that paired nicely with his sailor jacket. Then, he emerged from the hotel with his entourage and processed toward the falls. His walk turned into a parade as the crowd made their way to the platform with him. The town aristocrats, scoundrels, working men, women and children all cheered as Sam Patch moved to the base of his newly constructed jumping platform. Several accounts, perhaps colored by hindsight, but likely given Sam's reputation, state that Sam was clearly drunk, that he didn't move well, and that even standing still, he appeared to sway back and forth. He gave a speech to the crowd, the content of which, by all accounts, was unremarkable and nonsensical. Then, he climbed atop his platform and jumped. Undoubtedly, the crowd held its collective breath. Then, during his descent, something went wrong. Instead of his usual arrow-straight plummet, 
Sam's body tilted. He flailed his arms and hit the water awkwardly. The crowd waited for him to emerge, to see him defy the odds again and proclaim, Make no mistake, I am the real Sam Patch. Some things can be done as well as others. Instead, nothing. He did not emerge from the river to allow the crowd a collective exhale or a joyous moment of disbelief. There are no accounts of how long the crowd stayed assembled or who scrambled down toward the river to check and see what had happened. There's no reporting on what parents said to their children as they walked away from the falls after realizing they'd watched a man plummet to his death, or what those out-of-towners said to one another as they rode their coaches back toward their homes. One can imagine the sad aftermath and the streets of Rochester after having been overrun by a crowd greater than its population. The empty bottles, crusts of food, lonely Sam Patch handbills still posted around the city. It's unclear what happened to the hat full of coins collected for Patch or the money paid to the tavern owners for the subscription papers. This jump at Genesee Falls was Sam Patch's final jump, the one he didn't survive. However, this is also only part of Sam Patch's story. His fame continued to grow and he became more famous in death than he ever had been in life. Patch became an allegory, a folk hero, and the poems and songs about Patch were just beginning. More on that in the next episode. Thank you for listening to the Niagara Falls Daredevil Museum. If you're enjoying the show, please write a review and tell a friend. Also, please consider connecting on social media. On Twitter and Instagram, I'm Theodore Carter, too. I'm also on Facebook as well, and there you can join the public group, Niagara Falls Daredevils, to share your own stories and engage in discussions with others. This show is just me. There's no funding behind it or other people behind the scenes. So I'd love to hear from you to know more about what you enjoy, what you think I got wrong, or which daredevil I should research next. While I consulted many sources in the creation of this podcast, I'd like to mention two specifically, because they were the best and the two I referred back to most frequently. The first is Paul E. Johnson's book, Sam Patch, The Famous Jumper. The other is Richard M. Dorson's article, Sam Patch, Jumping Hero. The music you're hearing now is from Holizna. Thank you for listening, and please visit the museum again. Thank you.